Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Abby Williams, Vice President of the Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention at the U.S. Institute of Peace. I would like to welcome you to the Institute and to thank you for your interest in the topic of today's public event, Can We Prevent the Next War? Um, clearly, the school turnout on a Friday morning is an indication that uh, there is a broad, substantial interest in, in prevention. Uh, USIP is committed to the prevention of violent conflict. Uh, our board of directors recently approved the strategic plan of the Institute, which identifies conflict prevention as one of the Institute's priorities for the next five years. <coughs> we believe that violent conflict is not inevitable the need to prevent such conflict is urgent, and successful prevention is possible. Uh, the violent conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, and elsewhere continue to remind us of the importance of conflict prevention. While the level of conflict declined sharply following the end of the Cold War, largely from the termination of ongoing conflicts and reaching a low point in 2004-2005, it appears that that, decli that decline has stopped. And of course, new conflicts continue to erupt at roughly the same frequency as has been the case for decades. I think even skeptics of conflict prevention would accept that prevention is preferable to peacemaking and post-conflict peacebuilding in moral, strategic, and financial terms. It is always much better to prevent rather than to respond after all the bloodletting has occurred and to manage the consequences. The responsibility to protect, which was uh, accepted at the World Summit in 2005, recognizes that prevention is by far the most effective form of protection. In his speech at West Point last month, President Obama stated, America will have to show our strength in the way that we end wars and prevent conflict, not just how we wage wars. And senior administration officials, like previous administrations, have also underlined the importance of acting to prevent conflicts. Prevention is also what the United Nations was created to do, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. But we clearly have to take prevention more seriously and to do a better job uh, at it. This is why we convened this panel uh, to address key questions. What do we know about how to prevent new conflicts from breaking out? How much progress have the United States and the international community made toward preventing new conflicts? How can the United States enhance its own capacity to engage in effective conflict prevention strategies. We are fortunate to have three outstanding panelists who will address these important questions this morning. Their bios have been distributed, so I will introduce them very briefly uh, in the order in which they will speak. Lawrence Wucher is a senior program officer in the Institute's Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention and works on early warning, conflict prevention, and the prevention of genocide and mass atrocities. He's <coughs> the author of a recent special report published by the Institute, Preventing Violent Conflict, Assessing Progress, Meeting Challenges. Paul Stairs is General John Vesey's Senior Fellow for Conflict Prevention and Director of the Center for Pre Preventive Action at the Council on Foreign Relations. And I should also add that Paul was my predecessor at USIP, so Paul is a member of the USIP family. He is the co-author of a council rep special report on enhancing US preventive action, which was issued last October. And Paul Dobriansky served as Under Secretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs from May 2001 to January 2009. And presently, she is an adjunct senior fellow at Harvard's Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs. 
Uh, they will limit their opening remarks to about uh, 15 minutes, and then we will have a, a question and answer period. So, Lawrence, you have the floor and the podium. <coughs> Thank you, Abby, and good morning to everyone. I think, uh, like Abby, I sense that there's really been a resurgence in the last couple of years in interest in uh, our ability to prevent violent conflict. And we see that in more statements from senior officials in the U.S. Uh, and abroad, as well as mobilization of NGOs and academic interests. It seems to me this is really the first time since maybe the uh, immediate post-Cold War period when there's been this level of interest and attention to prevention. At that time, in the early, early and mid-90s, the, the interest in prevention was really, I think, stemming from a sense that now freed from the East-West rivalry and the preoccupations of the Cold War, we could finally uh, pursue these sort of higher aspirations of uh, humanitarian goals and uh, paying attention um, to these parts of the world that may have previously been neglected. Today, I think that the interest in prevention comes from a somewhat different uh, calculation, which is really that uh, it's not that we can now afford to pursue these uh, objectives, but that we can't afford not to, that we have so much on the current agenda in terms of the existing crises and conflicts today uh, that if we don't get better at getting ahead of the curve and getting uh, uh, more effective at preventing the next conflict, uh, we'll just simply be overwhelmed uh, by the, the current agenda. If we do a little thought experiment, take any region of the world that interests you uh, and think of the portfolio of the Regional Assistant Secretary of State, uh, and then imagine what if there was a new uh, civil war that erupted next month in their region. Um, the South Asia Bureau, they have their hands full clearly. What if there is a civil war in Bangladesh? How could they respond to that? Um, in, um, in Latin America, what if there is a break out of armed conflict across the border between Ecuador and Colombia while they're trying to mediate the Honduras crisis and so forth and deal with Mexico and other things. In Africa, uh, where there's uh, such a variety of, of crises being dealt with, um, what about a, a, a resurgence of conflict in West Africa? Maybe in Mali and Niger erupt into large-scale conflict where we have some concerns about uh, possible Islamic radicalization. We quickly can see that this is really something we need to take very seriously, and it's not just a uh, would be nice if we could prevent these kinds of things, but we need to, to sort of make them uh, more central to our strategic thinking. So what I'd like to really do is make a, a, a short argument for the importance of prevention um, based on some empirical analysis. Uh, and then uh, go to some recommendations uh, that I make in my report uh, broadly applicable, I think, to the international community. The argument for the importance of conflict prevention usually takes three forms. There's the moral case that basically by preventing wars we can save lives. The financial case will save money if we can prevent conflicts instead of respond to them after the fact. And the strategic argument that we actually uh, are able to manage our interests better um, and, and contain the stability in, in various regions if we can prevent conflicts from escalating into large-scale <laughs> violence. I think these three arguments are enduring ones. They're true. I, I re would reinforce them. But I think we can also point to some reasons why prevention is important today uh, based on some empirical analysis. Um, so. First, as Abby alluded to, uh, we've seen since the end of the Cold War a quite dramatic reduction in the overall uh, number of armed conflicts around the world. Quite a positive trend that took us a while to kind of wrap our arms around because it seemed somewhat counterintuitive, but uh, is quite robust. There's been a, a strong reduction in the overall level of, of violence, uh, political violence around the world. But when we try and unpack this, we find that the, the frequency and the rate of new armed conflicts, new onsets, uh, really hasn't changed. And in fact, hasn't changed for a period of decades. 
So roughly speaking, depending on how you count them, four or five new armed conflicts tend to break out every year. Um, so if we look into the future and we think about how can we sustain this quite significant reduction in the overall levels of political violence, we're going to have to make a, a difference at this rate of new onsets because we will ultimately, the, the number of ongoing civil wars that we can bring to a conclusion is, is shrinking, thankfully. So the persistence of new conflict uh, onsets. Second point is that we're actually, we may be entering a, a period of greater uh, conflict risks from a number of uh, specific factors. I'll point to four. First is the increased uh, number of um, unstable regimes, what uh, academics tend to call anocracies. These are not neither full democracies nor full autocracies, but some kind of middling type of regime where there's inconsistencies there may be uh, a deal of repression and control from the center, but also some kind of elections. Now, these kinds of regime types have been shown to be at significantly greater risk of uh, breaking out into violent conflict um, versus democracies or autocracies. In fact, uh, one analysis suggests that historically they've been six times more likely to experience societal wars than uh, have democracies. And the, the fact is that we've seen a great increase in the number of these kinds of regimes around the world uh, that has accompanied the period of democratization. So while it's positive to see an increase in democracies, we also see this uh, concomitant increase in anocracies, which tend to be a greater risk of conflict. Second regards global economic turbulence. Uh, of course, we're <coughs> We're still undergoing this global economic crisis, hopefully past the worst of it. If we look at the connections between uh, economics and conflict, we find that negative economic growth as well as uh, economic shocks, that is to say a significant downward shift in the, the level of growth, uh, both are associated with increased risk of conflict. Um, one academic study found that a negative growth shock of 5%. So that's, let's say, a country was growing at 8%, and then there was, because of the crisis, is now only growing at 3%. That kind of economic shock is associated with uh, an increase in 12% uh, likelihood of violent conflict breaking out in the following year. So we can see that there are a lot of countries that that based on historical experience are actually in a period right now and over the next few years will be at greater risk uh, of breaking out into new conflicts. Third point is climate change. Um, we, we hear lots of debate about climate change. One of the uh, points that's talked about a little bit more on the margins is the relationship between climate change and conflict. And the argument is not that climate change uh, causes conflict per se, but that the greatest impacts of climate change are likely to be felt by uh, countries that are already experiencing significant stress and, and struggling with instability and poverty, uh, and that climate change, climate changes could tend to push these countries uh, over the line into full-fledged uh, conflict. By one analysis by International Alert, there are 46 countries. Uh, which will experience effects of climate change interacting with economic, social, and political problems, uh, creating a high risk of conflict. The fourth specific factor that I think suggests we may be entering this phase of increased risk of conflict is uh, what you might call shifts in global power distribution. And historically speaking, we find that when there are significant shifts in the distribution of global economic and military power and political power. Uh, these are dangerous periods. These kinds of transitions uh, tend to be precarious. And the consensus uh, at this point is that we're seeing some kind of broad shift away from what was termed the unipolar moment uh, at the end of the Cold War when the United States was truly uh, predominant to something uh, closer to multipolar uh, dynamics. Um, 
and that there tends to be, generally speaking, a shift towards the east and towards some of the um, mid, uh, mid-income developing countries like Brazil uh, and India. Um, and there's huge debates around sort of the, the shape of this kind of uh, path of, uh, of changing power distribution. Um, but there's clearly some kind of shift going on. And again, the his- historical record would suggest that this uh, is a period which brings specific kinds of dangers that uh, declining powers may be more likely to um, be aggressive to try and maintain their position of, of dominance in their regions or globally. So I think these four factors really should give us some uh, reason for concern about the likelihood of, of new uh, armed conflicts breaking out in the next several years. The other uh, p- part of my argument for the importance of prevention is in relating prevention to post-conflict peace building. And uh, some make the case that really when we talk about new conflicts, we're really talking about the same old conflicts, that this, these are, are cyclical, and that most new conflicts are really just the relapse of conflicts that ended and our post-conflict peace building efforts failed and that's what we, we're seeing. So that if we really focus on post-conflict peace building and get that right, we will really solve the problem of, of conflict prevention. Um, by my analysis, this is actually a flawed uh, argument. If we look at all of the cases of new conflict onsets since 1990, uh, only a minority of those are actually, uh, can be considered relapses of recently terminated conflicts. So a number of these are, are truly new. At least they break out in a, a country that hasn't experienced conflict in several years or between parties that have not previously been uh, at war with each other. If we just look at the last few years and some of the, the conflict onsets of the last few years, um, Russia, Georgia, Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, um, Chad, Pakistan, very few of these can be, if any, can really be considered sort of classic cases of failed post-conflict reconstruction or peace building, but they really represent kind of new challenges and, and new conflicts. So this all to say that I think we do need to focus not just for humanitarian reasons, not just for Uh, moral reasons, but if we want to do our best and most efficient job at managing the levels of global political violence, uh, we do need to pay greater attention to uh, effective strategies for preventing new conflicts. My report goes on to then um, try and assess the global uh, progress in three domains, in the normative and political support for conflict prevention, institutional capacities that have been developed for this purpose, and then knowledge that's been developed around how do we target uh, and shape preventive strategies. To get to the recommendations, I want to just give you a word on each of those. Uh, Basically, I would say the normative and political support at a general rhetorical level globally is quite strong. Um, The institutional capacities is a story uh, that's very mixed. Uh, and needs significant attention. And knowledge is uh, somewhere where I think there's some very positive signs, but also uh, a ways that we can continue going further. And let me take them up in, in the recommendations, which I try to uh, draw to be generally applicable through the international community. First, and unsurprisingly, I think at this point, is to try and recalibrate the Um, balance of policy attention and resources between conflict prevention, peacemaking, and post-conflict peace building, and really shift our attention more upstream towards the prevention issues. Try and make it truly a must-do priority rather than something we get to after we deal with everything else that's on our plate. Second, monitor implementation of existing political commitments to prevention of armed conflict. As I suggested, there, I don't believe there's much utility in debating whether prevention should be on the international agenda. There are lots of existing uh, commitments to doing this, and the question is, 
how do we make sure that our institutions, our governments, international institutions are living up to these commitments. Third, bolster international, uh, excuse me, institutional capacities for prevention. And I think here we have to recognize that uh, experience suggests that when we have generalized uh, capacities that aren't sort of earmarked, if you will, for prevention, they will tend to get sucked up by dealing with the crises of the day. And so even if the kinds of things that we're talking about, whether they be mediation capacity um, or security assistance or the like, they may be the same kinds of tools that you would use in other uh, settings for post-conflict reconstruction or the like. If we don't sort of wall some of those off for uh, prevention, uh, we're likely to find we have little left uh, when we try to take up preventive case. Fourth, try and expand our knowledge of conflict prevention to help move from the conflict prevention toolbox to effective conflict prevention strategies. The toolbox is a metaphor that's really used extremely frequently and is useful in, in pointing out the range of, um, of measures that we can apply to uh, conflict prevention strategies, but it, it only goes so far. We need to think about what is the strategy, how can we anticipate the, um, the, the, the plays and counterplays of different parties, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, apply the same kind of serious strategic thinking to conflict prevention that we apply to war fighting, peacemaking, and all kinds of other things. And then finally, uh, develop new political strategies to try and regularize the practice of conflict prevention. <clears throat> Too often, our advocacy of prevention uh, tries to rely on kind of calling on our leaders' goodwill, they're better angels, and just pay more attention, and that will solve the problem, just do it. Um, I think we need to try and develop some more sophisticated strategies, political strategies, institutional strategies, to make this more of a regular uh, and, and not a, um, a special kind of activity that goes on within our institutions. So just to conclude, if we go back to the, the question of the day, can we prevent the next war, which perhaps is meant to be rhetorical, but I guess I, I would just make a vote in the affirmative. We don't need to imagine that we can prevent all wars to think that we can influence uh, conflicts around the world and political dynamics and reduce the rate of new conflicts uh, erupting. Could we imagine a world where instead of four or five conflicts every year breaking out, we have two or three? And would that make a difference for the United States and the global community? I'd say most definitely yes. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks, Abby, for the invitation to uh, speak here today. It's good to be back at USIP. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to, to be here, to uh, see many old friends, uh, Bruce Gentleson, Michael Lund, who've done the, the real intellectual spade work in the area of conflict prevention. We owe a great debt to you and others here as well. Uh, as Abby said, um, uh, uh, the council commissioned and uh, I wrote, uh, co-wrote actually, the report on enhancing U.S. preventive action. And I want to give you a sort of a, a brief outline of the, uh, the principal findings, the core arguments and, and recommendations of that report for you today. And I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. <clears throat> In terms of core arguments, they, they pretty much echo much of what uh, Lawrence has already uh, stated at the outset. The U.S. has to put more emphasis on preventing crises. Since the end of the Cold War, the principal emphasis has been on stabilization and reconstruction, actually the, the downstream response to conflict management. I think uh, on average since the end of the Cold War, the U.S. has conducted a stabilization and reconstruction mission every 18 to 24 months, um, each lasting five to eight years. This has been a hugely costly undertaking in terms of not only operational costs, but also lost foreign assistance, foreign aid, and so on. And we argue in our paper that the imperative for preventive action is even greater today. The U.S. is militarily overstretched in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
to say nothing of other deployments around the world. We're seeing increasing attention given to Yemen today. We're hemorrhaging resources. I think we've already spent three quarters of a trillion dollars in Iraq. We're up to a quarter of a trillion dollars in Afghanistan. And of course, I'm not even mentioning the many thousands of Americans killed and wounded uh, in both those wars. Simply put, the US cannot afford another major military commitment at this time. We have to prevent the next war, uh, not just in the immediate future, but for the foreseeable future. We're, as many of you know, $12 million, uh, sorry, $12 trillion in, in debt. Um, there are, of course, other reasons to uh, put more emphasis on prevention, uh, important political strategic reasons. Uh, Lawrence laid out, I think, that very compellingly. I think we are potentially entering a, a very uh, dangerous period uh, for many of the reasons that Lawrence mentioned. Emergence of new powers, uh, traditional sources of instability that, that is uh, uh, set in motion as a result of new uh, power distributions in the world. New security threats are emerging, proliferation, organized crime, and so on. Uh, new stresses as a result of environmental change. I think we'll, we'll begin to see that more and more in the future. Um, now, as many of you who followed conflict prevention uh, in the past and done important work in this, uh, it has gone in cycles. And, and as Lawrence said, there was uh, certainly a, a renewed uh, rhetorical commitment to this uh, at the end of the Cold War. Um, and we're starting to see that now. Uh, it's sort of the, the, the wheel has turned, if you will. The key is actually to, to, to uh, translate that rhetorical commitment into a real operational commitment. And as we argue in our report, the US has not done a good job in organizing itself effectively for preventive action. I think this is evident in three areas in which we go into uh, in our report. Firstly, in terms of uh, long-term efforts to reduce the threat of conflict before it emerges in places that we really care about. Secondly, medium-term efforts to prevent crises from developing when we start to see the early signs of instability and conflict emerging. And of course, short-term efforts when, uh, when a crisis has begun to, to break out and to try to prevent it from escalating uh, and reducing its consequences. Let me go through each of these key findings uh, which are in the report. Firstly, in terms of, of threat reduction, conflict threat reduction, the US has no coherent strategy or strategic planning process to address potential areas of instability, and certainly in the areas that we care most about. Uh, we do some long-term uh, assessments, but these are not integrated into, as I say, a co coherent strategic planning process, and there is no real coherent set of policy responses and strategies, as, as Lawrence mentioned. I think this is most evident in the foreign assistance programming area. As many of you know, this is a, a deeply flawed and broken system. It's, a, however, a major tool for addressing instability around the world, particularly in, in weak states. Currently, there are 20 agencies overseeing 50 programs in 150 countries. This is, this is just not working. And I'm, I'm happy to see that there's efforts underway to uh, try to address this. There's also poor coordination between uh, civilian assistance and increasing military assistance in this area, which has grown in recent years as the US military has begun to play a more important role uh, in what it talk calls phase zero or shaping operations to try to reduce the, the potential for conflict. Secondly, in terms of crisis prevention, uh, we have a huge intelligence uh, collection effort, a very effective one. There are several very uh, useful and important early warning products that are produced uh, on a regular basis, watch lists of uh, unstable countries and sources of, uh, or potential sources of mass atrocities. These, these are all produced. But uh, uh, from our assessment, these are, however, are largely disconnected from any kind of established preventive planning process within the US government that would respond to these warning signs and design appropriate measures. It's just not, just doesn't exist. Now, SCRS, the uh, Coordinator for Stabilization <coughs> and Reconstruction, has the authority to do this, the mandate to do this, but it just hasn't had the, uh, the, the resources and the, the real institutional clout to do it. 
Thirdly, in terms of crisis management and mitigation, uh, intelligence collection in response to <coughs> emerging crises, it's, it's very difficult to shift resources at uh, short notice. The Bush administration developed an uh, interagency management system to try to, to manage crises. Uh, it's never been uh, put in, in uh, uh, practice. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's consequently, there's very little, um, I think, confidence that it actually would work if, if pushed to, to do so. There's very little surge capacity in the system to uh, respond to crises, particularly use, uh, be able to access uh, emergency funds at short notice for particular crisis, although I see Congress is now finally addressing this issue. Um, so there's much to do in terms of improving the uh, actual organizational predisposition of the U.S. to preventive action. So what do we, what we actually recommend? Firstly, in terms of uh, improving U.S. strategy, we, uh, we think the first order of business is that the U.S. needs to develop a clear and coherent strategy that differentiates between different uh, conflict prevention priorities based on their real significance and importance to the U.S. Um, we have to, uh, this has to be set out and provided in, in a coherent fashion to provide broad guidance to the rest of the U.S. government. And we think this should be part of a uh, reinvigorated strategic planning process that should be run out of the, the NSC. It's, it's currently very, very weak. Uh, in terms of early warning, we advocate streamlining the current early warning process. Uh, the Director of National Intelligence should, as it's part of its annual threat assessment, also produce an annual assessment that would lay out um, uh, the most worrisome areas of instability so that uh, Congress and both the rest of the government was really informed of what our priorities should be. The various watch lists uh, we feel should be consolidated into a single list uh, rather than, than multiple lists. Uh, we think that's important, again, to emphasize where the real priorities should be. Uh, and these should also be prioritized. As for anyone who has seen these lists, they tend to be undifferentiated in terms of their likely impact uh, and consequences. Most importantly, these early warning <coughs> products should be integrated into an established interagency preventive planning process. At the moment, they tend to be delivered and essentially, um, as someone said, they're basically drive-by warning. The, 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 the briefings are given, but it doesn't actually trigger a, a specific preventive response uh, um, to, to specific warning. Thirdly, in terms of planning and programming, um, we argue in the paper that this should now shift to the White House. Uh, that is where the real authority eyes to actually move the system and we advocate the development of two dedicated NSC directorates uh, for this purpose with associated interagency planning committees. Uh, firstly, a directorate for development and governance to oversee uh, foreign aid programs and other foreign assistance programs. Secondly, a directorate for prevention, stabilization and reconstruction to really do the, the, the planning that we advocate needs to be done in response to, to early warning and to oversee a, in a sort of seamless fashion um, planning for stabilization and reconstruction. Uh, SCRS, we, uh, despite its flaws, we feel it should be retained and uh, strengthened, uh, but it has to give greater emphasis on prevention, perhaps even being renamed the Coordinator for Prevention, Stabilization and Reconstruction. Finally, in terms of resources, uh, we endorse the, uh, the efforts underway to rebalance uh, the civil military uh, um, uh, capacity uh, the, to reverse the sort of the hollowing out of USAID. <coughs> and so we, we are very supportive of the current efforts to increase the number of uh, um, AID positions and, uh, and positions at the State Department. The, Temporary um, authorities that have been awarded to the Defense Department for um, uh, foreign assistance, particularly in the area of security assistance, I believe we should we believe should be migrated back to the State Department. Again, there are signs that that's happening. Um, Congress should also, I think, approve, and I think they, they've uh, in the omnibus bill that was passed just before Christmas, 
um, uh, continue to fund this rapid response, this crisis response fund. I think they've given 50 million. I think that needs to, to be increased in the future. Uh, the various civ civilian res response corps that, that the S SCRS manages, um, uh, I think they should be uh, enhanced uh, uh, in the future. It's, this, it's a very slow, halting progress, uh, process at the moment. But I think their relationship with uh, expeditionary capacities at AID need to be reviewed. And it's that, that there's still a tension in the system between who does what and, and what places and so on. And I think there are finally some other diplomatic initiatives. Uh, I'd like to see the development of a mediation support unit developed uh, at, at, uh, um, uh, at the State Department as well as other diplomatic uh, surge capacities to, to backstop diplomatic initiatives that might be necessary at short notice. So overall, we, we um, lay out a, a kind of blueprint for uh, reorganizing the, the US government to making it more predisposed to uh, react uh, and uh, both anticipate and react to potential sources of instability. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any further questions. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. First, I'd like to congr congratulate the uh, U.S. Institute of Peace for <coughs> holding this uh, very timely and important roundtable. And I'd also uh, uh, like to uh, congratulate uh, and recognize uh, all of the panelists and our moderator in, what, uh, in their analyses and also the recommendations. But I think also very significantly what struck me is that these reports have very practical recommendations and realistic recommendations that I think can be put into place. Um, and interestingly enough, both of the reports are mutually reinforcing. Um, uh, I think that uh, Lawrence, as he gave in his presentation, uh, is really giving a very compelling series of arguments as to why this issue matters and why it must be a priority. The CFR report, uh, I think, placed more of a premium on the bureaucratics <coughs> and what are the kinds of changes that should be uh, undertaken. So with that very broad uh, statement, uh, let me uh, uh, try to summarize some of the core points and then add uh, to what has been said. I think the first most critical point coming out of both of these reports is the fact that there is a need for the development of an effective strategy, that the approach cannot be ad hoc, that it cannot be piecemeal, that you have to have it substantively integrated, and in order to achieve that, you have to have a bureaucratic process that is established, which in fact uh, does that, which is integrative, and uh, in which you're uh, tapping not only the public side, but also in the reports it mentioned the importance of the private side and how that must be integrative too. So I wanted to add that point uh, because um, uh, it wasn't necessarily something that was highlighted this morning, but it's something that struck me. It's not only the, uh, the framework that's set up in government, but also the private side. Many of you here in this audience who are committed to these issues and have worked on these issues, um, your role is uh, critical. So first, there's a very need uh, for a strategy, development of a strategy, and in turn, a strong interagency process. The second piece comes out of the CFR report, which does go in at length about the importance of uh, NSC and the White House's role. Personally, I have to say I'm very sympathetic to that, um, that argument. Um, uh, the NSC uh, uh, is to have a kind of a clearinghouse, an integrative role. The only question that I'd put forth, and maybe it's something that Paul can answer, is why have two divisions instead of one division uh, here? Maybe the answer is it would be too overwhelming. But also what I would worry is by having two, are you really ending up with having two tracks and really having, ironically, maybe not the kind of integration that you would <coughs> want. 
Thirdly is um, uh, both um, in uh, uh, the reports really underscored the importance of good intelligence analyses um, uh, and the importance of very active and thorough review, review of watch lists. Um, our knowledge remains thin about how to respond. And this is, I think, one of the biggest challenges. But that's very much interrelated with the first point. If you develop a strategy, that's going to be very much part of your, um, uh, of the uh, a kind of process. Lawrence highlighted, and you heard him say, the importance of, um, uh, of uh, uh, monitoring implementation, also looking at your toolbox, um, and having a review of your toolbox. I think that's right. You know, we have a lot of instruments, but I think one of the challenges, are they being used effectively? Um, is there an overall strategy? And then in turn, how do you use those particular um, instruments? Um, uh, many of them are itemized in the, in the report. One that I, I wanted to pick out, because there have been here in town a number of fora devoted to the role of women. And I, I wanted to mention that in this mix, because uh, in fact there have been a number of roundtables specifically devoted to the issue of women, not as victims, but women in the role of leadership and impacting conflict prevention. And are we thinking more creatively about how to tap um, resources there? There's a second point in the toolbox that I also want to pick out. Uh, I had uh, one of the responsibilities when I was in government. I happened to be the special envoy to Northern Ireland. I was very struck by actually uh, the individuals who for decades um, uh, had been uh, not engaged in dialogue but engaged in violence and use of force are now very strongly committed to the issue of lessons learned and how they have actually used that and transferred that to other countries to sit down and to talk about these are better ways forward. So another piece that I would put into this mix is also using more effectively uh, the issue of lessons learned. And maybe some of the people who were initially committed to, if you will, the use of force, but now have stepped back and have said that's not the right way their voices can in fact be uh, some of the most uh, compelling ones um, in uh, preventive uh, actions. Um, both uh, reports, I think very importantly, talked about the regional context. Um, I didn't hear that so much this morning, but I want to highlight it because I thought it was very important about uh, not only what we do, but the kinds of bridges that we build with other institutions and how effective that could be. This is a critical point, not only from the development of strategy, from the development of support, uh, also the issue of putting this at a high level, having a good network, both publicly and privately, but also the ever perennial issue of resources here and how you can do this most um, uh, effectively. You need to have um, a, a network. You need to look at a situation not only purely in an isolated context, but you need to look at the, the broader impact all the way around. Um, a comment uh, on the issue of the State Department's office. One of the things that I have heard a number of uh, State Department officers uh, speak to um, on the State Department's office, which um, um, in the uh, Council on Foreign Relations report uh, advocates uh, uh, its continuance. I think it serves an important role. I think it was a very good development. I think that um, uh, it does play uh, a very uh, critical role and it will continue to do so. But one of the issues for that office, I think, is how effectively to get out into the field and really have a complementary role to our embassies and our people on the ground where it adds value and where you're not going to have um, uh, duplication. Um, we have a lot of analysts back in Washington, but I think where really uh, assistance is needed is in the field, preventively. That's uh, one of the things uh, that I would add to this mix. Two last points, resources. Um, resources are very limited. Both reports talk to this uh, issue. 
um, extensively. I was very struck by um, a statement, uh, or uh, if you will, a, uh, a line um, uh, by uh, Robert Zellick, uh, the head of the World Bank. He had an article in uh, the December issue of the IISS survival. I don't know if uh, many of you had seen it, but if you had seen it, he posed one of the questions about resources and resources being too limited and what are the challenges. He basically said it's hard to get donors to pay attention to something that has not yet happened. When I read that, I said that goes to really, I think, the core of this issue. And the question is really how do you get around that? How do you, um, um, uh, you know, make that compelling arguments. Well, I think we've heard some very compelling arguments um, this morning from um, uh, our two um, uh, experts. Finally, uh, I would say um, Paul uh, mentioned uh, um, uh, how we look at long-term, medium-term, and then presently what we do. I'd pick on one aspect of the long-term, and that is far too often uh, uh, we in the United States, we want quick results and we concentrate on the quick, but um, we, we don't take the time or the effort to really, really spend a lot of time on the longer term. And from that standpoint, I would want to say that that long-term commitment and strategy matters greatly for this issue. If we're going to have an impact, and this is going to be, as uh, Lawrence said, a must-do priority, that absolutely has to be a part of our strategy forward. In sum, I thought both of these reports are outstanding in their analysis, and I want to underscore again in their practical recommendations, um, uh, which I think are ones that are not only concrete, but very thoughtful and very doable. Thank you so much. Well, I would like to to thank uh, Lawrence and, and Paul for their excellent uh, uh, um, presentations and uh, Paula, of course, for her insightful observations. Um, I would like to, uh, as the moderator, to maybe pose some questions to uh, both uh, Lawrence, Paul, and, and Paula. Uh, before opening it up to uh, uh, question and, and answer session from uh, the audience. The first question, I think, it's for Lawrence. Um, you rightly mentioned that there's been strong support for conflict <coughs> prevention at the normative and at the political level, and that w one of the recommendations is that we should monitor effectively the implementation of existing political commitments to conflict prevention that have been made by governments, international organizations, and NGOs, and I think that's right. But I wonder whether perhaps you might take it a step further and say how exactly one would do this monitoring, which is a critical recommendation. <coughs> uh, the second question would, would be for Paul. Uh, the report, of course, um, touches on a number of uh, important bureaucratic changes to help our government do a better job in, in conflict prevention. Uh, in, the, in your presentation, you did not discuss in a great detail about the resource issue. You alluded to it uh, in the observation that greater resources would be needed at USAID for positions and also resources for new positions at the State Department. And I wondered whether perhaps um, you might comment on how feasible the recommendations would be on the resource issue, um, not only given the real uh, political constraints and difficulty which Paula mentioned in the piece by Zelleck in trying to get resources for something which hasn't happened, but also the very serious fiscal and economic challenges that we now confront. In, in the government. And then third, for Paula, uh, I thought since, of course, you've spent a great deal of time at the State Department, uh, you were there for eight years, one of the um, um, realities of governments and bureaucracies and foreign ministries, international organizations, 
is of course the institutional culture in those places tends to be rather uh, reactive. So we're talking about the UN or regional organizations, or the OSCE. So I wondered whether you might reflect on the basis of your experience um, how you move, say, for example, the State Department from this culture of reaction, which is fiendishly difficult, to one of a culture of prevention, which I think is part of, of this issue. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> um, yeah, the question of what does it mean to monitor the implementation of these political commitments I'm not thinking of anything too fancy. I mean, basically, uh, I mean, uh, advocates of conflict prevention, whether they be NGOs, uh, citizen groups, or, or other governments, or other in international organizations, taking the political commitments and the words of these leaders seriously, and uh, sort of echoing, echoing them back to those leaders and saying, well, what are you doing, practically speaking, to make this a reality? So if we take just one example, um, there's a UN Security Council resolution which expresses its determination to pursue the object objective of prevention of armed conflict as an integral part of its primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. Now, when, and they also in that same resolution expressed willingness to consider what they call prevention cases um, at the Security Council. So the next time there is a case that, uh, that you or we believe should be considered by the Security Council, which is not yet f a full-blown conflict, um, but there's some reluctance among the member states to consider it, well, th this is the kind of thing I think that can add a little bit in terms of the persuasion and the pressure uh, to get them to, um, to change their actions. And um, also just, to, I think, trying to say, if you've made this kind of commitment, you know, what is it you're doing? You don't have to do every uh, recommendation in the CFR report, but you have to do something. You can't just make these <coughs> statements and then say, well, we're trying really hard. That's not good enough. There needs to be some tangible action that they can point to. Thank you. Paul? Thank you. Before I address your question, uh, Abby, about Brazil, I just wanted to get back to your, your question about why, why did we recommend splitting up uh, or creating two separate uh, directorates in the NSC? Um, and uh, as you alluded to, we felt that it was, it was just too huge an undertaking to put everything, since conflict prevention in itself is, is so multidimensional and huge in itself, that it was still better to focus uh, efforts uh, designed to um, oversee foreign assistance, to promote uh, governance, democracy, and so on, in one directorate, um, and uh, more sp specific efforts to plan for contingencies to anticipate potential crises and, and oversee their management in another one. But, they, but the, the senior directors for, for each respective directorate would be able to, um, well, would be coordinated, but also would sit on their respective interagency planning groups. So they would be fully coordinated. But we felt it was just too, too big a, an area of, of work to, to fall under, under uh, one directorate. Uh, on the resources issue, um, it's less that we are pushing for uh, more resources for prevention and, and rather than a more strategic reallocation of existing uh, obligations and appropriations. And I think this is most evident in the area of, of foreign assistance, um, which is, as I say, uh, hugely uh, incoherent in the way funds are allocated, the priorities that are given to certain countries. Uh, and I think we all know some of these issues uh, quite well. Um, the, the amount of money that's, that's uh, being appropriated for use by the military for this preventive action. And it, it, it's really about making a more rational use of existing resources as much as, as increasing them. Where I think the, the more funds are necessary is, is to respond to, to short-term uh, crises. Um, uh, I, uh, Lawrence has heard me talking about this concept of just-in-time prevention. Because it's so difficult to anticipate uh, crises and, and, and react to them in advance, that you, you nevertheless have to have this nimble, flexible capacity to respond to them when, when the, the, the signs are unmistakable. So having a, a flexible source of funding 
to manage co conflicts before they, uh, or prevent them before they really get out of hand is, I think, where uh, additional resources are really needed. <clears throat> On your question, my very simple answer is that's not an easy task. I, whatever institution one talks about in terms of changing culture. But let me say I'm an optimist, and I'll give you a very concrete reason why. Uh, as the Undersecretary for Global Affairs, I'll pick out that piece, because in the first um, uh, uh, period it was, uh, there was the formal title, um, part of my portfolio was dealing with health and science issues. And guess what? That exact same question was asked of me many, many times. Health issues, you didn't have health issues at all addressed in the context of our foreign policy or strategy, and was there any preventive action? Um, in my unit, in my line at the time, we had um, an office. I looked at the whole growth of the issue of addressing HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria. But it went beyond that, um, uh, also to uh, 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 dealing with SARS, dealing with avian influenza, and where there was actually an international network created, and in which it became truly, a, I think, a very significant change, um, uh, an orientation of how practical action mattered greatly in preventing <laughs> the spread of a virus. Um, and then the other area I'd pick out is an interesting one. Some of you may know it, some of you may not, and that's the area of science, uh, actually. Uh, there was, um, interestingly enough, um, Richard Solomon's wife, Ann Solomon, Solomon, a scientist, was very active in the issuance of a report um, that came uh, years ago at the end of the Clinton administration recommending that there be a science envoy um, or a science administrator, if you will, at the department. Well, out of that, uh, the whole culture shifted from just purely having science agreements to actually having, now you have, I think, up to 50 scientists um, uh, interning in the department. And you know how they're funded? By the private sector. I'm mentioning that specifically because of the point about resources not only from government but the role of the private sector. So, uh, forgive the long examples, but uh, I'm an optimist that in two significant areas where you had virtually no um, culture <laughs> surrounding those issues, um, they evolved. And so, with the establishment of SCRS, I think uh, that office has grown significantly. Um, uh, the first uh, head was Carlos Pascual, now our ambassador to Mexico. Uh, now you have uh, John Herbst, Ambassador John Herbst, two very seasoned diplomats, but not only that, creative thinkers. And I think that it has moved significantly from where it was to where it is now. As you hear from these reports, more needs to be done, but I'm optimistic that there's a foundation from which to build upon here. Thank you. Well, let me now open it up uh, to, to questions from uh, the audience. We have a, a microphone there, so perhaps the easiest thing would be for you to just uh, walk to the microphone if you have a, a question, and then just tell us your name and institutional affiliation. Okay. Right. Bruce? Uh, Bruce Kettleson. I'm actually here. Um, wearing both my hats. I'm a professor at Duke University and um, currently serving at the State Department on a consulting basis as a senior advisor to the policy planning director. Uh, first, my compliments to panelists uh, on, on the written work and also on your presentations and to USIP for all of its work with which I've had a long and valued uh, relationship. Um, a couple of comments and then maybe a couple of questions. One, I think I want to pick up on a point that's in Paul's report right at the beginning to emphasize it because I think it's, it's, it's very much it's very important, which is that while we focus a lot on the organizational issues, and they're extremely important, Paul makes the point up front that it's also about strategy. You know, and so while we've got to get the organizational structures right, both in the State Department and our agency, we really have to think through the, the strategy component. Uh, and Lawrence makes this point, too, about thinking not just sort of in terms of instruments, but, but putting it together. Um, and it kind of relates to your question, Abby, and, and to Paul's comment, which is if one were to imagine uh, a speech by a president or secretary of state, you know, fundamentally dedicated to this question of prevention. 
uh, as distinct from, say, a paragraph or two in a larger speech, or, or if it became a framing issue in certain kinds of documents, you could see the bureaucracy responding to that, right? Then suddenly that might affect allocation resources. It affects people's own sense of how they're going to get ahead. Uh, and I think that that's why the focus on strategy, how do we think about this like deterrence? I mean, how do we think this in a lot of different ways? At the same time, that's very tricky. I mean, I think the inherent dilemma of prevention just came out in some of your discussions and it was in the paper today with the WHO now being accused of was H1N1 really as bad as you guys said it was? How do we know? You know, was this a case of prevention? Was this a case of overreaction? And you can imagine that's an inherent dilemma in prevention. I wonder if anybody has any thoughts further about how, how to wrestle with that. Um, there is some traction, I'd, let me just simply say, within the administration now, some work on this, um, just to sort of, just to make that general statement. Um, question for Paul on the tier one, tier two, tier three. Uh, how, have you guys tried to operationalize that? I mean, you know, in terms of where we would put certain countries and then go back and see, you know, sorts of things. I mean, you can think of a number of countries now, uh, uh, you know, and while on the one hand it may come off the watch lists, uh, on the other that has to be factored in with, um, you know, with sort of the levels of importance you did. Uh, and then the other question, suggestion uh, for, for anybody really is, is there work being done not just on what USG needs to do, but on partnering with other key entities? Um, you know, UN, the International Peace Institute is doing a lot. Uh, NATO, this is part of their consideration of the strategic concept. Uh, so one of the other steps to complement your studies on what USG should do might be to sort of figure out how to connect with uh, what might be done elsewhere. And if there's anything being done, I'd be interested. If not, maybe, you know, you guys could be the ones to do it. Okay. Do you want me to? Yes. Um, this is going to sound like I, I set Bruce up to, to ask this, this question. I'm going to take the, the last part first. But we're actually doing a complementary uh, study that looking at um, enhancing international preventive action and particularly focusing on uh, how the U.S. can leverage uh, international capacities for pre preventive action. I think, um, you know, we, we hear the, the, the refrain all the time that none of these problems can be dealt with individually. They all require partnerships, and um, I think that's very true. And uh, again, however, there doesn't seem to be a, a coherent strategic approach within the U.S. government, correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, about how to leverage this ter terrific capacity. And it's not just resources, it's not just um, people able to carry out, you know, mediation missions or, or oversee elections, which can be uh, become flashpoints for conflict. Uh, but it's the, the, the legitimacy that, that collective action brings to preventive action, and, and in terms of providing access to to particular areas that may be off limits to to the U.S. And given that that most, if not all, of the the principal conflict challenges are primarily internal. It requires that kind of legitimacy to, to transcend the, the, the barriers to, to uh, intervention into uh, other states' affairs. So it's, it's, it's absolutely important. Um, we're looking at um, what are the, the relative or comparative advantages of different uh, organizations uh, for particular types of threats. Uh, again, using this sort of uh, three-stage approach of, you know, uh, uh, risk reduction, crisis prevention, crisis mitigation management, and looking at who does what, how can they, what can they bring to it, and then in turn how the U.S. can leverage those, those uh, capacities. I should say we're also following this up with a third report, which actually gets to your uh, suggestion, which is looking at how we can better harness the private sector, both in terms of business community, media, various NGOs, private diplomacy actors, uh, but, but that's, uh, that's another issue. We can, we can perhaps have a, an, an, uh, organize a meeting on, on that because I think that's the, the private capacity is also a key, key element here. In terms of your first point, uh, Bruce, um, this is uh, the, the need for a strategic approach is, is, is clearly important. I didn't discuss uh, what is in the uh, report about how we should do this. We lay out uh, a kind of uh, schema, a three-tiered schema, which uh, lays out uh, where U.S. preventive priorities should be. And there are clear dilemmas to doing this, uh, but 
is basically driven by the notion that not all conflicts are equally consequential, both in terms of their absolute impact, but also more specifically to their, their impact on, on US interests. And if we are to think strategically in terms of the attention that we give to any particular area, the tasking that we give to intelligence agencies and analytical groups to, to warn us of certain threats, um, as well as the, the, um, the seriousness that we take the, the warning when it does come, it has to be driven by some kind of, of, of prioritization. And that's, that's kind of what we offer. But as we've discussed in the past, Bruce, there's a real issue here because some countries that may be uh, d way down on the list of priorities can suddenly become very important in terms of the threat they pose. So there has to be a system to uh, review prioritization, to suggest that maybe a country or a particular area of the world that was has for, for some time been considered a, a low priority issue, uh, if the confluence of events or, the, or there is some um, set of indicators that suggest that, that this actually has the propensity to, to raise or rise up in the level of, then, it, then it sh there should be the flexibility to do that and to review it. And I, I'm not sure there's any other way to do it. Otherwise, you treat everything as equally important and, and that isn't being strategic. And, um, but uh, what I think is, is somewhat controversial about what we argue is that um, some issues that may not be the pet areas of concern for some groups uh, are relatively low in our estimation and, and we put uh, much more importance in ensuring that um, uh, great power rivalry and, and uh, interaction with rising powers doesn't become a source of instability and, and to many that's considered kind of old think in terms of, of, of conflict prevention but we think unless you have got that part of the, the puzzle right, then everything else I is of less importance. So. Okay. Sorry, I'm for a long-winded no, that's right. I think perhaps what I would do, I would take um, the questions in, in sets of two, basically now, okay, and then turn it to the uh, panelists, make sure that everybody has an opportunity. Yes, hello, uh, my name is Mona Kennedy, I'm not affiliated, and I'm interested in the particular case of the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. My question is, how significant was it as a case of conflict prevention to both the UN and to the US? And what were the lessons learned? How significant are they to us today? Thank you very much. Hi, <coughs> Michael Lund, uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, uh, uh, thanks for striking another blow for conflict prevention, if I can put it that <laughs> way, um, uh, among the whole series that we've had here and other places. Um, just not to get into the bureaucratic squabbling about where the main emphasis sh or uh, responsibility should be, but to uh, ultimately touch on Paul's argument about uh, the NSC as being critical here. It seems to me we're to some extent uh, get, b getting misguided by thinking of prevention as a special action notwithstanding your discussion of threat reduction as being kind of the first tier of, of, of emphasis and attention. Um, but rather than that, it's not something that should be thought of, and I think we're moving in that direction, in fact, as some sort of something that's added to normal diplomacy, development, and defense policy, but integrated into the fabric of what these organizations uh, and programs do uh, on, a, on a more day-to-day -day basis, notwithstanding that some withstanding that some countries are obviously requiring more priority attention than others. But there's already movement in this direction. Uh, the donors uh, through OECD, DAC, and UNDP, and, and uh, World Bank, and so on, are already fashioning development or, uh, programs to be more conflict sensitive, although that's not gone uh, as far as it should go in their respective institutions. Um, another sort of argument, on in behalf of sort of pushing the responsibility down to the, ultimately the level of countries, particular countries, is the um, whole notion of fragile states. Uh, we haven't really talked about fragile states, but in, in some ways I think we're moving in a direction that, that defines that as kind of the source of a lot of these other problems, uh, including, for example, the, the, the vulnerability of Haiti right now to a <coughs> federal disaster. Uh, a very weak state that just doesn't have the ability to do anything. Um, 
so uh, if the problem is uh, fragile states and the inability of institutions to cope with emerging problems within their sphere, um, as you two guys know from our colloquium last June at the Wilson Center, there was a lot of emphasis there on strengthening the existing resiliencies and, and institutions at the country level. And what the international community and the U.S. should be doing is, is putting a lot of emphasis behind that as the first front, so to speak, in, in conflict prevention. Given that sort of argument, um, I wonder whether the NSC, as high up as it is in the, uh, uh, in the hierarchy, is the appropriate place uh, for the responsibility given uh, the uh, being swamped with so, so many other issues traditionally, conventionally, uh, and not therefore accentuating and buttressing the existing activity at the lower levels, including uh, development agencies working in particular countries. Um, it, it seems to me we've got a sort of, this also helps to mitigate the resource question, the political will question. It's not like we're looking for special things, turning points in these countries but we're monitoring on an existing basis either processes of deterioration or processes of, st of strengthening. Thanks. Okay. Well, the first question was on Macedonia, and I hope the, the panelists and, um, will permit me, if I take the liberty of responding to that question, they re at least give some observations because I served in the UN mission in Macedonia as the political uh, advisor at the mission and also did a book on it. So let me just say things. In terms of the, the lessons, and I'll be quick, I think the first one is that one of the difficulties of um, uh, prevention is that sometimes uh, countries at risk, uh, certainly the political authorities do not recognize or do not want to recognize that they're problems and to seek the assistance from the international community to help. In the case of Macedonia, you had a very far-sighted president, <coughs> President Ligora, who recognized that there was a problem and asked the United Nations for help. The second point I would make is that um, the UN got there early enough to make a difference. And um, it is, um, you know, as Ford says, in in Mary Wives of Windsor, uh, better um, three hours too soon than a minute too late. So we got there early enough to make a difference. The third, I think the Macedonian experience points to the importance of an integrative strategy, certainly for UN missions, and I think that also applies to other kinds of help trying to make a difference. So you had a military mandate uh, uh, to monitor and report developments on the border, uh, both Nordic and, and uh, implemented <coughs> by Nordic and American troops. You had a political mandate, a good officer's mandate, which the special representative of the Secretary General used to try to deal with the very real internal problems in the country. And we develop uh, um, a social development side to deal with some of the underlying causes in the country. The fourth thing I would say, of course, there's always, there should be some, uh, the, the, the mandate should be, uh, the resources should be commensurate with the mandate. So we had uh, not a yawning gap between what we were being asked to do and the resources which were being provided, certainly on the military side, also on the political side. And the final point I would say, it, dem it, it, um, it was fairly successful because at the political level you had uh, united support uh, in the Security Council, certainly amongst the P5. Uh, and of course, this was in the early sort of honeymoon period at the end of the Cold War. And really, what you have in the Security Council on any issue is really, if, you're going, if it's going to work, the coalescence of five foreign policies of five different countries. And in, in, the, in 1992, those interests came together, which helped. But let me now turn, I guess, Lawrence to admit maybe uh, comment on uh, the point that Michael Lund raised and maybe Paul sure. might want to as well. I think to, thank you for the, the comments there, quite <coughs> helpful. Um, to the question of is sort of fragile states at the heart of this, I guess I would flip it a little bit and say we're, we're seeing less of a trend of states becoming more fragile than we're seeing a trend of the governance challenges becoming greater and, and more complex. 
the implication is not just uh, analytic, but it's I think that we need to think about governance solutions at the state level, but also at the uh, global level, the regional level, and the sub-state level. Um, <clears throat> so strengthening capacities of states is certainly one and extremely important uh, leg of that. I think the, the sort of question about mainstreaming versus specialization, there's a tension there. Um, sometimes diplomats will say, well, everything the State Department does is conflict prevention. Or, or uh, development professionals will say everything that USAID does is conflict prevention. There's a certain amount of truth to that, but it, it doesn't quite work, I think. So we need, it seems to me, a, a certain kind of signal of a special priority, even if the activities that are undertaken are going to be common activities that, that would be done for other purposes. Um, to signal a priority from the top and to um, establish kind of regularized processes and dedicated uh, capacity and resources. Because um, I think if we see cases like SCRS where prevention and stabilization and reconstruction are all given, uh, at least in the, in the mandate, equal billing, um, we find in reality that prevention gets the short, sh short end of the stick. Yeah, I. I I would second um, uh, Lawrence's uh, comments, I, and I agree with you, Michael, that you know that conflict prevention is not a discrete, standalone activity. I don't have to tell you this. And, uh, and it, it, it gets back to Bruce's point that um, uh, because of that, you require, because it covers so many different things and you, you get at a particular challenge in so many different ways, that it, it puts the emphasis on, on um, on strategy and making sure that this is a coherent approach, uh, and but you still need, however, um, somebody to to push that um, uh, and to 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 have the in place procedures and, and and processes that would would further that kind of uh, of attention to a, a preventive strategy, um, but but creating a sort of standalone entity at the NSC for conflict, I think would be a mistake. Uh, you know, we, we wrestled with this on the genocide uh, task force, prevention task force. Do you create a, a, a sub-directorate or part of another direct purely for the prevention of genocide? And, and we largely argued against it because it, we felt that it would just orphan that, that whole process. It would seemingly check a bureaucratic box, but frankly make make the task even harder. Um, and so I think it's in critically important that, that uh, it be integrated in, into mainstream frontline efforts. Um, uh, in terms of, of the fragile state and where that should be run out of, I, I, I think it would also be a mistake. I think, frankly, it'd be impossible to put all the responsibility for managing that at the NSC. What we have, were pushing was, was nevertheless uh, an entity there that would oversee, manage, coordinate, guide that activity that s would still reside primarily at AID and State Department and other, other agencies. It has to have that centralized authority that has the, the real um, backing of the, the President and the White House. Thank you. Good. Two more questions. Thanks. Bridget Moikes with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Uh, just to echo, thank you uh, for this important work and for the panel and discussion. Um, I'm encouraged by the opportunities there are right now to make it progress on building prevention capacities, particularly on the civilian side, which is what um, the discussion has been focused around here. But my question goes a bit more to the reducing that reliance on military force. There was an AP article this week um, that signaled that the upcoming quadrennial defense review will um, make the priority over the next four years uh, winning current wars while preventing new ones. Um, so the military is looking at prevention, which is encouraging. But I, I'm um, a, not convinced, I guess, <laughs> that the U.S. can be a leader on prevention without directly addressing um, its military, its, reliance, its own reliance on military force. So I wonder if, if um, you could speak to that. Okay. Yeah, Bernard Harbour from the World Bank and uh, echo some of the questions which have already been asked. But the first, I think you, you lay out a convincing case, but I think the big question for politicians or, or decision makers is where has it worked? And poor old Macedonia keeps on being put forward as the, the one possible case. Um, 
but there's been a lot of work done, for example, on disaster prevention. Uh, the last time there was a 6.8 earthquake in California, two or three people died. We see in Turkey or in Haiti today, tens of thousands died because there wasn't a real disaster reduction strategy. I think the links with conflict prevention, partly because they're so ideological, that case hasn't really been made. So I would support Lawrence's point about there still needs to be a lot more empirical analysis between prevention measures <coughs> and what actually works. And so I'd like some reflection on that. Um, and secondly, this, yeah, the big elephant in the room is why when we talk about conflict prevention, we don't talk about the huge <coughs> escalation in, in military expenditures, both globally and in the US. Is that something which is, which is off the table in this discussion? <coughs> I wonder whether uh, Paula, would you want to do you, uh, say something? I don't think either yeah? of those. I think okay, those all right. Are because I, know I would like to make a comment. Uh, I've uh, made notes on some of the points. Okay, so I'll give you an opportunity and I know we at have the two end. More questions. Exactly. I think I'll come in. <coughs> okay. Thanks. Well, why don't you make it quick so we can uh, get the okay. last two questions in? Uh, on Bridget's point, um, you know, I, the, the it is heartening to, to see the, the, the US military putting emphasis on this, and it's, it's at the same time unsurprising given that they bear the brunt of many of the stabilization or all the stabilization and reconstruction missions. And so, um, as I alluded to briefly, they've been uh, broadening their concept of operation to, to embrace uh, early prevention, what they call shaping operations, phase zero operations, and this has been going on several years and, and moreover um, uh, buttressing it with actual um, uh, foreign assistance uh, uh, particularly near a security assistance to, to key countries um, in, in terms of over dependence um, I think <coughs> if, you, if you asked any of them they they would say no we, we, we have to have a full spectrum of, of capacities here this you know decisions to prevent or to intervene shouldn't just be um, uh, a question of, of uh, either doing very little or, or sending in the Marines, so to speak, um, and that there has to be a more um, uh, developed set of uh, options available for any given situation. And, I, and we, in other contexts, have, have laid out that kind of uh, framework in, in sort of mixing and matching different um, diplomatic, economic assistance activities to provide that kind of broader range of, of um, options. Um, in terms of cases of things, that places that have worked, and uh, Bruce has done excellent work in this area in terms of where um, uh, uh, interventions, early interventions did work, sometimes uh, not as well as, as hoped. Um, uh, probably a, a recent case that a lot of people hold up uh, was uh, the intervention in Kenya after the, the elections in, in 2007 and 2008, um, while we, the international community was late to the to the uh, the effort, it nevertheless mobilised itself very effectively to prevent uh, that conflict uh, from uh, or the initial conflict from from escalating further, and it, it is held up as moreover as a, a case of what is called hybrid preventive effort in terms of a partnerships between international organizations, national governments, as well as the private sector. And I think there's some other cases, even Sudan and, and uh, Indo-Pak conflict, where, where intervention at early stage, mm -hmm. often in quiet terms, has worked. Um, parts of Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, South Africa. South Africa. Uh, Michael, you please jump in. You, you know the, the, the record better than than most. Um, so I think there, there are plenty of cases and people, uh, you're right, do tend to focus on good old Macedonia as the, uh, as the, the, the one shining example, but I think there's a, there's the record is, is actually uh, much richer than, than is, is uh, held up to be. So who could take last two, two questions? Then? Yes, thank you. Uh, like everybody else, really appreciate the opportunity to have this, this session. Uh, I'm Chick Dombach with the Alliance for Peace Building. Um, but first, an observation like everybody else, and, and then a question. The observation being that language matters, and words matter, and one of the difficulties we've had for forever in the kind of work we do is a, a fuzzy identity of who we are and what we do, uh, using several words, uh, 
post-conflict reconstruction, conflict resolution, and so on. But the word, but the word peace building has begun to emerge as kind of the, the core word. The USIP now uses it. You know, if you look at the handout today, the right below USIP is peace building, and then going on. And peace building, not just referring to post-conflict, which somehow got into the lexicon, but it, but peace building is prevention, mitigation, and post-conflict. And I think if we can, just a, a, a word to everybody in this room and everybody else, to the extent we can do that and identify it that way. And Paul, as we talk about uh, SCRS, I would love to see it be called the Office of Peace Building, and then we develop a real understanding of what that is all about and have something to to build around. The, this, the second comment, though, is, is that we have a tendency in the, the, the peace building world to talk among ourselves, and I think we've done the research and developed the intellectual capacity and, and grasped the concept of what needs to be done strategically and integrated uh, whole of community, not just whole of government, though that's been difficult enough, but whole of community to integrate the private sector and so on. What we've not done a good enough job of is conveying that message to the policymakers on Capitol Hill or within the, the uh, uh, government agencies. And there are two concurrent initiatives underway right now where those policies can be dramatically impacted. One of them is the QDDR, and the other is the efforts on behalf of the House Foreign Affairs Committee to rewrite the Foreign Assistance Act. And so my question is, uh, are the, the people on the panel and others actively engaged in actually taking these messages to the people who are creating these new policies so that peace building can actually be incorporated in a robust way into U.S. foreign policy as we go forward? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Anderson. I'm with the uh, Civilian Response Corps through the Department of Justice. I'm interested in some of your thoughts on SCRS. That is, you've mentioned the fact that it's underfinanced, that it lacks clout, that it competes with USAID. I get the sense that you think it's being maybe suffocated in part uh, by the Department of State. And I wondered if you've, if you've had thoughts as to whether you believe it properly should reside and be nested within the Department of State, or whether it should be in the NSC or perhaps elsewhere. Thank you. Go down. Sure. Um, <clears throat> First one, comment on the, the question of knowledge and where has it worked and what works. Um, I do think we can tap into the, the historical cases uh, to address the key questions for policymakers more effectively. But at the same time, let's not uh, hold ourselves to a higher standard than we do for other objectives or pursuits uh, of, of uh, our foreign policy or international action. Is our knowledge of effective conflict prevention really all that uh, more deficient than our knowledge of what works in uh, alleviating global poverty or countering radicalization or a whole host of other things that we judge to be important and we do our best and we try and learn as we go on but we don't have really perfect knowledge of? I, I would say not. Um, just a, a comment on uh, Chick's point. Uh, USIP is uh, definitely supporting the QDDR process, uh, particularly the working group on uh, preventing and responding to crisis and conflict. And as you know, they do have a sub-working group which is um, specifically dedicated to what they call targeting prevention. Um, so I think, I mean, I know they have looked at these reports and we're, we're in conversation with them to try and make sure these ideas are in that process. Uh, I'm less familiar with the process on the Foreign Assistance Act reform, but certainly that seems like a good opportunity as well. Um, Paul, do you want to touch on SCRS and perhaps I know you follow the foreign sure, assistance. Sure, yeah. Um, those two points. Yeah, we um, we were also um, engaged with the the folks doing the QDDR and uh, to the extent they've sought our advice, we provided it in, in um, sort of informal settings, and I think some of the ideas contained in here have been been circulated around and. Um, uh, from what we've understood, have been received quite quite positively. Um, SCRS, um, I, I must admit, caused a lot of hand wringing on my part um, because um, there's a lot of people who I think would like to have seen it go away. They felt that it was um, something that really uh, uh, was unnecessary, particularly uh, and maybe distracting from some of the the efforts of, of uh, USAID, particularly in the area of sort of expeditionary capacity. 
We felt, though, that on balance, uh, with the right resources, with appropriate authorities, with appropriate leadership and backing from the White House, that it was still important to, to retain SCRS. Certainly not, shouldn't be shifted to the NSC, which uh, should not have a, an operational role. Um, but uh, on balance, uh, it, it, it should remain where it is. Uh, more effort, obviously, be put on the, the prevention side of, of, of its mandate it has, um, uh, but not uh, really um, pursued in a, in a forceful fashion. Um, I think it's now starting to get the resources that it needs. Um, I think in the last omnibus bill, it didn't quite get the amount of money it wanted for those civilian uh, reserve um, uh, component. Um, but on balance, I think it, it can play a role and will eventually be accepted because I think the other bureaus within the State Department will will understand that, that you know, this is, this is not some small uh, insurgent operation. It's actually now a, quite a large uh, bureau in its own right, and I think over time it will start to play uh, or be seen as, as, a, as an effective player uh, in the system. I just had a few points to make uh, before we close. Uh, just on that uh, last question, uh, personally, I won't repeat, but I, I support uh, what Paul just said. Um, uh, I uh, think it, uh, it certainly has uh, grown. It's gotten more of what it's needed. Um, it has still some ways to go, but I think it's really advanced significantly, and um, uh, it should be at the department. Um, three quick points. Um, uh, going back to Bruce's point on strategy, I just want to underscore that because in my own commentary and reading the reports, if I had a, a single message that really came out of these reports that I thought was absolutely critical, it was that. Uh, and you, you know, that was your point right off, off the bat. And I, I wanted just to reiterate it again, how critical that is if you, we want to make a difference in this area. Secondly, um, uh, I couldn't help but pick up on fragile states. The title of Bob Zellick's uh, piece in Survival is Fragile States Securing Development. I happen to myself chair at what's known as the Bipartisan Policy Center um, as part of their national security initiative, a fra stabilizing fragile states. I see that as critical in, the, in this mix. I, we, we touched upon it. But um, um, uh, uh, it, 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 it directly relates to preventive action, because when you look at the roster, uh, you're looking at fragile states. Um, my final point is, in preparing for today's meeting, and I hope my colleagues don't mind, because um, their reports are outstanding and they're full-fledged reports, I was preparing and reading some things and trying to get a current not only on their reports, and I was struck by several things. I came upon, uh, um, uh, you know, the article that I've mentioned uh, by Robert Zellick, Fragile States Securing Development. The Wilson Center had this roundtable on the role of women in prevention um, and con uh, conflict resolution. But also, I, I mentioned to my colleagues, uh, and I, I got this uh, from Hans Binden Binnendijk's uh, shop, and I don't know if all of you are familiar, it's a new journal of the Center for Complex Operations. Why I'm mentioning it to you, what struck me is it's diplomacy, defense, and development. John Herbst has a piece in here, and it's interesting, it's totally devoted to this topic, from Senator Luger to John Herbst from a military perspective, and I found it a very interesting reading. The only reason why I'm mentioning this is I was struck by the fact that this issue has a lot of traction. These different quarters are coming together to really think about what are uh, the most uh, practical ways forward and that we do need change. So that's on that note that I would. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, it remains uh, for me now just to, to thank you, our audience, for joining us uh, this morning and for your active participation. And I'd like you to join me in thanking our three excellent panelists for their contribution.